Hello! Hi guys! Welcome to Sunday Assembly! I'm Ryan, I'll be your host for today. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, we are a God-free community that celebrates a worldview grounded in evidence and reason. We invite everyone to join us as we do our best to, say it with me, live better, help often, and wonder more. We will hear today from, or today's theme is good grief. We will hear from Re Grief Beyond Belief founder, Rebecca Hensler, about finding and giving secular support through love and loss. Hey, look at that. It's the world's only atheist a cappella choir. What a crazy random happenstance. It's been a project of Atheists United since 2001 is currently conducted by Sunday Assembly's very own and my best friend ever, Katie Sharp. Please welcome Voices of Reason. Check, check, check. Find me, oh Lord. Oh Lord, won't you find me? Oh Lord, won't you find me? Did it, 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 did it,
Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you guys. Today, some of you guys brought items for our item drive. It benefits the Richstone Family Center. Richstone Family Center is one of the most progressive centers of trauma-focused treatments and the prevention of child abuse in LA County. Items range from arts and crafts supplies, school supplies, and gift cards. They do a lot of coloring, as you can see by their logo. <laughs> Next time we are collecting on or collecting canned food items for the LA Regional Food Bank. Consider it your admission to the assembly. We don't charge anything, but if you could bring a canned food item, that'd be great. We're really terrible at food drives. <laughs> um, as you were signing in, volunteers may have asked you, Julie and them, um, if you have any ups and downs or general life events that you might want to share with the community. Some of you guys turned some in. We actually have a Salem milestone, though. Um, one of our board members, our organizing committee members, is leaving our organizing committee, but he's not leaving the community, but he's been promoted to the director of, or wait, what is it? It's director of photography, right? Yes. So everyone give a warm round of applause to Ian Dodd. That is not an easy feat. It's been, it's been three decades in the making, and he finally landed it on the show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, so, Jonathan got a big, new, exciting project at work. Congrats. Yes. <laughs> Nicely done. Ash says that don't give up. Our music video was released on YouTube with featured artist and songwriter Maggie Sasbo and the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles. Congrats. Oh, so 
Davey, one of our milestone regulars, <laughs> is very excited that his grandparents have moved in for the summer. Aww. I want my grandparents to live with me, but I have both sets and a set of great-grandparents still kick it. Well, my great-granddad passed er er earlier this year, but I, I couldn't live with all of them. <laughs> but I wish. I can dream. So if anyone has any milestones they'd like to share, I have this mic, and we'll run it around the room. Okay, we'll start here. Check one, one, two, one, two. Check, check. I think that's picking up in my mic, Is it though. Working? Maybe. Oh, okay. uh, yeah? Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Sounds like it. Okay, many milestones. Um, my name is Sloan, and I've been coming for a while. And tomorrow is Paul McCartney's birthday. But it's also my birthday, my 75th birthday. And he's a year older than I am. And where are my millions? <laughs> and I'm retiring from LA Unified School District, praise be. <laughs> but the sad thing is I'm moving to Albuquerque two weeks from today because I can live in the same size apartment for half the rent, but you know how that goes. <laughs> and I can live cheaply and warmly, so I won't be here. And unfortunately, there's no Sunday assembly in Albuquerque, but I could start one. Yes. There you go. Okay. And this is, this is my friend Joe, and it's his first time, so I hope he keeps coming back, okay? So I will leave him in my place. Thank you. Hi, is, this, is it on? <laughs> step this way, step this way. Oh, in the front. Can I, I'll go back here. Is this working? Is it work? Okay. Um, so this past month, um, I totaled my car, which is terrible. But um, I I didn't freak out, and I like I kept it together, and I remained calm, and I dealt with all of the insurance business all by myself, and um, I, and you know and like the other driver all by myself, and I like dealt with enterprise and like renting a car. And then I went to a dealership and I bought a car and I did all the haggling, which is like really intimidating to do when you're like a very small woman. Um, and I did all of it by myself and I feel like it, um, I don't know how I'm gonna pay off the new car, but they <laughs> let me drive it off the lot. Um, <laughs> and I, I felt like that was like a big milestone of me stepping into adulthood and I'm proud of, I mean, I'm really sad that I totaled my car, but I'm proud of myself for buying a new one that I can't afford. <laughs> Auntie Beth had my little cousin, Angus. Aww. Thanks, Livy. I have a new cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Going once. I can't see anyone, so. Okay. So my milestone was that I got to attend my first LA Pride Festival this past weekend. 
so much fun. Speaking of pride, um, it's Father's Day. Everyone knows that I love me some daddies. So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it just got... <laughs> um, but no, just to all you fathers out there and mothers who had to be fathers and parents who had to be parents, thank you guys, seriously. I texted my dad this big, long... My parents are in Kentucky. I texted him this big, long, happy Father's Day message today, and he was like, wrote back, I'm sorry, I was such a terrible father that you had to move all the way across the country. <laughs> I was like, God, Dad, get off the cross. Other people can use the wood. <laughs> so now it's time for, speaking of parents and what you birthed, it is time for Sayla Kids. <laughs> so if you brought your children, or you are a child, and you're not already in the green room with our child care providers, you can meet Amy right here, and she will take you to the child care room. Seriously, get out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next up, we have our audience interaction. Since the last two assemblies have fallen on Mother's Day and Father's Day, respectfully, I thought for audience interaction, we could turn to our neighbor and tell our favorite memory of our mom, dad, or maybe someone you just admire. So find those people with a blue dot on that will make best friends with them. <laughs> Um, back to our theme, every assembly we try to inject a little creativity. This Sunday we are featuring a reading from the book Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. Here to read that excerpt is Julie Williams. Life, life changes fast. Life changes in the instant. You sit down to dinner, and life as you know it ends. The question of self-pity. Those were the first words I wrote after what happened. The computer dating and the Microsoft Word file, notes on change, reads May 20th, 2004, 1111 11 p.m. But what would have been a case of my opening the file and reflexively, reflexively pressing save when I closed it? I had made no changes to that file in May. I had made no changes to that file since I wrote the words in January. For a long time, I wrote nothing else. Life changes in the instant, the ordinary instant. At some point, in the interest of remembering what seemed most striking about what had happened, I considered adding those words, the ordinary instant. I saw immediately that there would be no need to add the word ordinary because there would be no forgetting it. The word never left my mind. It was, in fact, the ordinary nature of everything preceding the event that prevented me from truly believing it had happened, absorb absorbing it, incorporating it, and getting past it. I recognize now that there is nothing unusual in this. Confronted with sudden disaster, we all focus on how unremarkable the circumstances were in which the unthinkable occurred, the clear blue sky from which the plane fell, the routine errand that ended on the shoulder with the car in flames. The swings where the children were playing as usual when the rattlesnake struck. He was on his way home from work, happy, successful, healthy, and then gone. I read in the account of a psychiatrist whose husband was killed in a highway accident. In 1966, I happened to interview many people who had been living in Honolulu on the morning of December 7, 1941. And without exception, these people began their accounts of Pearl Harbor by telling me an ordinary Sunday morning it had been. It was just an ordinary, beautiful September day. People still said when used to describe the attack the morning in New York when American Airlines 11 and United Airlines 175 got flown into the World Trade Towers. Even the report of the 9-11 Commission opened on this incessantly, predominantly, and yet dumbstruck narrative note. Tuesday, September 11, 2001, dawned a temperate and nearly cloudless in the eastern United States, and then gone. In the midst of life, we are in death, Episcopalians say at the gravesite. Later, I realized that I must have repeated the details of what had happened to everyone who came into the house those first few weeks. 
All these friends, relatives, brought food, made drinks, laid out plates, put dishes in the dishwasher, and filled our, I could not yet think, my otherwise empty house, even I had gone into the bedroom, our bedroom, the one in which there still lay a sofa faded terry cloth robe bought in the 70s at Richard Carroll in Beverly Hills, and shut the door. Those moments when I was abruptly overtaken by exhaustion are what I remember most clearly about the first few days and weeks. I have no memory of telling anyone the details, but I must have done so because everyone seemed to know them. At one point, I considered the possibility that they had picked up the detail of the story from one another, but immediately rejected it. The story had and was in each instance too accurate to have been passed down. It had come from me. Another reason I knew the story had come from me was that no version of what I heard included the details I could not yet face. For example, the blood on the living room floor had stayed there until Jose came in the next morning and cleaned it up. Jose, who was part of our household, who was supposed to be flying to Las Vegas later in that day, never went. Jose was crying that morning as he cleaned up the blood. First, I had told him what had happened, and he had not understood. Clearly, I was not the ideal storyteller of the story. Something about my version had once been too offhanded and too elliptical. Something in my tone had failed to convey the central fact in the situation. I would later encounter the same failure when having to tell my daughter. But that same time, Jose saw the blood, and he understood. I had picked up the abandoned syringes, the ECG electrodes, and came in that morning. It was an outline of my story. It is now as I begin to write this, the afternoon of October 4th, 2004, nine months and five days ago, at approximately nine o'clock on the evening of December 30th, 2003, my husband, John Gregory Dunn, appeared to, or did, experience at the table where he and I had just sat down to dinner in the living room, a sudden massive coronary event, coronary event that caused his death. Our only child, Quintana, had been for the previous five nights unconscious in the ICU at Beth Israel. At that time, a hospital in the East End known more commonly as Beth Israel North or the old doctor's hospital where what had seemed a case of the December flu, sufficiently severe enough to take her to the ER on Christmas morning, had exploded into pneumonia and septic shock. This is my attempt to make sense of the period that followed, weeks, months, cut loose any fixed idea I'd ever had about death, about illness, about probability, about luck, good fortune and bad, about marriage, children, memory, grief, about in which the ways people do and do not deal with the fact that life ends, about the shallowness of sanity, about life itself. I have been a writer my entire life. As a writer, even as a child, long before what I wrote had been, begun to be published, I developed a sense of what meaning itself was residual in the rhymes of words and sentences and paragraphs, a technique for withholding whatever it was or what I thought, believed behind an increasingly impenetrable polish. The way I write is who I am, or have become. Yet in this case, in which I wish I had instead of words and the rhymes, a cutting room, equipped with an avid, a digital editing, editing system on which I could touch a key and collapse a sequence of time and show you all the frames of memories that come to me now, letting you take your pick, the marginally different expressions, the variant readings of the same lines, this is a case in which I need more than words to find the meaning. This is a case in which I need to do whatever it is I think or believe to be penetrable, if only for myself. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, guys, we know that some people have been asking questions about the temperature and here that it's really, really cold. Um, we went to the city because they're the ones that has to adjust it, and they said that we would have to fill out a permit, pay $700, write our mama's letters, and have recommendations. Oh, anyway, 
It just came down to that they can't adjust the temperature for some reason. So we're sorry. We know it's as cold as a morgue in here, but, <laughs> but um, <sh> <laughs> Moving along, we have Rebecca Hens. Um, a little lower and a little flatter so that I can, while you figure that out, I have to do something. Mm. All right, people are going to be really offended if I tilt it. I just, I can't with this flag anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> as long as it's not on camera with me, I'm good. Uh, that'll be fine. I just, yuck. Sorry. All right. So usually when I speak about grief beyond belief, the story starts with my son Jude. Uh, however, here we are in Plummer Park and Plummer Park for me has deep meaning. Almost exactly 30 years ago, I walked into a building in this park and joined ACT UP uh, Los Angeles and became an AIDS activist. <sighs> Over the years that followed, I lost dozens of friends and comrades. Um, both during the time that I was an AIDS activist and during the time that followed. Back in the day, in ACT UP, we had this thing. We said we didn't grieve, right? We even said, don't mourn, organize. And so we would take our grief and we would turn that horror and sorrow into rage and turn the rage into action. And the action we engaged in, the political activism we did, changed the world. That's a whole different talk. But there is no question in my mind that we absolutely changed the world with the anger that we changed our grief into. But at the same time, when you don't grieve, a well fills of sorrow. And for so many of us, we kind of put a lid on that well. And we went through our lives. And when the AIDS activist movement waned, as all political movements do, we, well, many of us found jobs in the, uh, fighting the epidemic, but there were many people who did not, and many of those people ended up self-destructing and dying. They became homeless. They became addicted. Um, many of them ended their own lives. <sighs> For me, one of the worst weeks of my life was in 1996 when in the same week, I learned of the death of my dear friend Manuel Hernandez from AIDS and learned of the death of my lover, um, Casey Joy, of suicide. But even the depths of that grief didn't compare or didn't prepare me for the death of my son. And so that does bring us to Jude, right? 
in 2009, um, I gave birth to a beautiful little boy, bright blue eyes, red hair, just this little bundle of love. And you could see that love in the way he looked at me, in the way he'd hold people's hands or their fingers with his own tiny little hands, the way even in the infant ICU, on the machines that kept him alive, his his oxygenation statistics would go up when he listened to my wife sing Pink Floyd songs or listened to me read A.A. A. Milne poetry. He, like my comrades in ACT UP, was this combination of love and fight. And he fought so hard to stay with us. And his struggle went on for 90 days. And in the end, he didn't make it. Now, when your baby dies, no one <laughs> says, don't mourn, organize, right? I mourned. And I reached out. And I received some amazing grief support. But I also became really aware that there was this big gaping hole where grief support for people grieving without religious or spiritual beliefs belonged. And sometimes what that looked like was people projecting their beliefs on me. People saying things like, oh, your son's spirit is all around you because, hey, we're in California, right? Or people saying things like, oh, he's waiting for you in heaven. That was the online grief support, was lots of religion. And sometimes it just looked like not having anyone to say, I understand, that's how it was for me. Because I was grieving without any belief that either he was a spirit all around me or that he was waiting for me in heaven. And there really wasn't anyone there to say, I feel that too. So I started looking at how do we create spaces for those things? How do we create spaces for people to come together and say, I feel that too? Two years, about two years after he died, I founded Grief Beyond Belief. And at first, it was just a Facebook page. Um, I knew there was this need. I'd read people's blogs about this need, but um, I didn't realize how big the need was until I started the Facebook page, and there were over a 1,000 people following it within a week. And I realized that this was really going to be a thing. Grief Beyond Belief has grown since then. Now we have more like 20,000 people following the page. There's a closed grief, you know, confidential grief support group online that has 4,000 members who we vetted and added to the group. Um, we have a Facebook page. Uh, we have the Facebook group, but we also have a website, and the website has a library of over 300 links to writing and podcasts and videos all about grief and all entirely free of religion and spiritual content. And so there are these amazing resources. And I do these talks, and I go out and I do grief support workshops when people ask me to. I also realize that I can't be everywhere, and this can't be a one-woman project. And so over the past couple of years, I've written a short handbook. It's called the Secular Grief Support Handbook. So it's a guide to how local organizers can figure out what the grief support needs are in their secular communities and provide for those needs. And so I've learned a lot about what makes grief without faith different. Some of the things I've learned is that it's, you know, there's the basics. There's that we don't believe that uh, we will ever be reunited with the people who are here grieving that we love. Um, we consider death to be both complete and final. We also don't believe that there's a reason for everything. 
And, you know, there's good and bad to that, right? On the one hand, there's the there's that sense of not understanding. Why did this happen? Why, why my son? But there's also, honestly, a freedom from a sense that a lot of religious people do have, which is that there was someone out there with the power to save their loved one who some reason chose not to do it. And we're entirely free of that. We don't have to feel like there was, we didn't pray hard enough, or here we are in California, we didn't think positively enough. We also rely on science and humanist philosophies in our grief. Um, we, uh, there's one other thing that I do want to mention that is less true here when you're surrounded by secular people, but was very true for many of the people who were surrounded by the religious, so people who are in the Bible Belt and in the Midwest, which is that many people who are grieving without faith have additional trauma that come from the people around them projecting their beliefs onto them. And sometimes that trauma is terrible. We have memory, we have members who were told things like, you know, your child died because they didn't want to witness your non-belief, your lack of faith. I mean, just terrible things that happen to people. But we do, and we have found ways to comfort each other that rely on things that are real. So what have I learned about what comforts non-believers? Well, first of all, I've learned that it is absolutely a myth that there is no comfort for the non-believer. And there are even atheists who believe that, that, that if you don't have an afterlife belief, there is absolutely no comfort in grief. We're comforted by things that comfort everyone, like telling stories about the people we love and hearing stories from people who have memories of them. We're comforted by helping each other understand the seemingly irrational things that happen in the brain that when you're grieving. That thing where you're walking down the street and you think you saw the person you love even though that's not possible. The way your brain literally cannot accept the loss. Those self-protective things our brains do. And those self-protective behaviors we engage in, it really helps to hear that we're not the only people, you know, for me, I'm not the only one who goes the wrong way, the long way around the baby aisle just so I don't have to walk past all those things. We also really appreciate scientific comforts, um, the law of conservation of energy. You wouldn't think that this scientific law would be so comforting, but people really are comforted by knowing that all the energy that was in their loved one's body is still in the world. But more than anything else, we are comforted by meaning making. We are comforted by the ripples that our loved ones leave in the world and the things we do to honor them. And this is something that I had already learned from AIDS activism. Back when I was an activist, as I lost friend after friend, each loss became a step in a march. Each loss raised our voices louder and more powerful. And this truly did help us bear the pain that those of us who lived carried on the struggle of those who died. And we knew that their lives continued to have meaning even after they were gone because their lives led us to help change the world. So when my son died, I already knew that my love for him could change the world. Not through legislation passed or 
medications that were discovered, but through creating spaces for people to take care of each other. And through writing this handbook so that I could teach other people how to create those spaces. Literally every time someone sits down in a group and uses the information that I've shared and what I've learned to bring people together, to take care of each other, my son lives in those moments. I was even able to bring this knowledge kind of full circle to three years ago when I held a memorial for AIDS activists who had died. For all the lost comrades, not just my friends, but everyone we had all lost. I used everything I'd learned from Grief Beyond Belief community to create a space where those of us who were still living could finally come together to grieve and to bring the memories, not just the political memories, not just their rage and passion, but those sweet, quiet memories, what it was like when they smiled at us, what were the funny things that they said, what was it like to stand beside them or sit in a circle in a meeting with them? To bring those memories into the present. So today, my message to everyone who is grieving here is that it doesn't need to be either or. We can both mourn and organize. <sighs> And honestly, right now, we must both mourn and organize, right? Right now, there are thousands of immigrant parents who love their children just as much as I love my son and whose children are, some of them, literally caged alone. And we need to use our emotion and our love and our ability to put ourselves in that place and know what it feels like to be without the person we love. We need to take that into the, into the streets and into the places of power, right? So I have a feeling that just as I marched in memory of the friends I lost to AIDS, I'll probably be marching in memory of my son in the coming weeks. And that might not be your thing. Your thing might be different. But if you are grieving, I do encourage you to find a way to make meaning. Because we can bring our love for the people we've lost into the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Not only did you make meaning, but you took something that you couldn't find for yourself and made something that serviced other people too. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, okay, moving on. Welcome back, Voices of Reason. Thanks again. Uh, our next song is a little known song. Uh, it's called Free As. It's about diversity and inclusion. Uh, and speaking of inclusion, if you guys are interested in joining us while we're looking for new members, uh, you can find us at voicesofreason.net. Uh, all you need to do is love to sing, and you know, we, we, we get you religious or not, we take everybody. We're also into diversity and inclusion. So here comes free ads. Oh. 
but they disagree. It don't mean they are schmucks because we're free to be ourselves and we're free as yes. Phil is white and Tracy's black and Lynn is in between. Mark has got the greenest skin that you've ever seen. And though they might look different, no, they don't pass the buck. Cause when we're free to be ourselves and we're free as yes. fun. Okay. Each month an assembler shares a personal story about how they're trying their best. This month we're featuring Nicole Srolowitz. Did I say that right? Where's she at? Okay. She better not have. Okay, um, Dad, I, I have um, a bunch of people who want to say something to you, um, so just hold on a minute. Um, so, so when I point the phone at you, just like everyone yell Happy Father's Day to my dad because I'm trying to be a better daughter. Um, okay, are you there? Ready? Ready? All my, all my friends want to say something to you. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about our Jewish family to a bunch of people who don't believe in religion. Okay, bye. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was, um, since it's Father's Day, I was um, originally planning on wearing a hand-me-down shirt from my dad that says, um, bring out your dead from Monty Python in big letters, um, but I couldn't find it because I also inherited my dad's organizational skills. Um, um, and yeah, so even though I uh, moved to LA, I'm not an actress, so I have to read this word for word without making charismatic eye contact. Um, anyway, so, um, my name's Nicole. I'm one of Sela's uh, representative Jews, or as I like to call it, Jew theist or Jew Gnostic. Um, so I was raised Jewish, if you couldn't tell by my, my last name, uh, Srulowitz. And um, since we're here to talk about grief, I'm here to explain the Jewish custom of sitting Shiva. Um, Shiva is, of course, a religious-based custom, but there are different ways to interpret it, and in the end, it's not about obeying a higher power. It's about fully focusing on mourning, celebrating the life, connecting with friends and family, and my favorite part, eating a buttload of food and cake. If you're not familiar with Shiva, I'm here to explain it to you. Um, a Jewish funeral and burial has to occur within 48 hours of the passing, and it's a brief service um, focused only on the morning, so it's a time spent for sadness. 
Um, at the service, the rabbi, which for those who aren't familiar, is kind of like a Jewish priest, but without the confession thing. Um, so the rabbi tears the shirt of the deceased immediate family members, and they proceed to wear the same torn shirt for the next week. And by torn, I mean it can be like a pocket or a collar, uh, not anything too dramatic or like urban outfitters. Um, so sitting shiva lasts for a full week, and you, um, the rules are, you know, the religious rules are that you don't go to work, you don't leave the house. Um, instead, family and friends come to you and sometimes people travel across state lines, sometimes it's friends you haven't spoken to in years, and you all sit in a circle and celebrate the life that you're mourning. Um, it's all about celebrating the life. So unlike the funeral, you're allowed to laugh and you're allowed small talk and bullshit talk, but primarily you share stories about the person and you talk about their accomplishments and the lives they changed and their funny movement, their funny moments. And um, when my Zaidi died, which is Yiddish for grandpa, um, my family passed around his discharge letter from President Truman after he'd spent three years in the Navy. Um, for my Bubby, which is Jewish for grandma, they showed photos from her youth when she was single and according to my dad, had a rockin' social life, and Zaidi was a stud. Um, but the best moment of Bubby's shiva was when they passed around a letter from one of her nieces, which talked about how my Bubby took her niece into her own family after the niece's mother had passed away and raised her as her own. And so they read the letter aloud at the shiva to show who Bubby truly was as a person. Um, and when my Bubby died, my uncles, Christian and Catholic co-workers all came to, as we say, pay a shiva call um, and told us how they thought it was a brilliant concept, not just for closure, but to take a week specifically for focusing on the loss. Um, when it comes to the, to, to the traditions or rules, so, so you say, um, the point is to avoid all luxury and vanity. Um, Jews love to mourn. Um, so during shiva, shiva, we sit on low, uncomfortable chairs for the full week as opposed to regular chairs, which are considered a luxury. Um, you wear the same ripped clothing the whole week. You cover every mirror in your house so that you're never concerned about vanity. Men don't shave for 30 days. Um, you don't shower, which is typically a rule only held by super religious folks. And according, again, to my dad, um, you're allowed to shower when someone tells you that you smell. Um, <laughs> so basically, if you want to shower without necessarily breaking the rules, uh, you just have to ask someone to tell you that you smell bad. Um, but most of all, sitting shiva is a way to connect people. Um, you leave the door unlocked for the whole week and people come and go and sometimes it's people you haven't seen or spoken to in years. Um, and my favorite part, everyone who visits brings food. Um, it, seriously, it's like a second Thanksgiving. You lose space in your kitchen. It's absolutely insane. Um, you end up giving food away to other people who are visiting you. So they'll like give you food and you're like, I don't have room for this. Like, you can take this cake. Um, so it's just whole exchange of food. And, um, um, yeah, and this is especially great because usually when Jews mourn, it's traditional to starve themselves because of all that Jewish guilt and whatnot. Um, so Shiva is, is like a party. Um, it's a, a sad party, but with a lot, a lot of cake. Um, so even though I was raised Jewish, um, I obviously never connected with the religious aspect. Um, but to me, Shiva never feels religious. 
Um, it's not like a funeral. There's no, they're in a better place now rhetoric. Um, it never feels like it's about a higher power. And even now, as a fully secular person, I would still sit Shiva because it feels like the most comforting way to mourn a loss and the best way to respect the person that you've lost by dedicating so much time to them. Um, but of course, everyone needs to mourn in their own way, and sometimes Shiva can be too much for a person, especially if you're introverted. Um, my oldest and dearest friend just lost her grandma, who she shared an especially uh, close bond with as she's adopted and her grandma found her from the Ukraine. Um, so she's taking the loss really hard and most days Shiva's more than she can emotionally handle. Um, her family and the traditionally religious folks don't like this. Um, so that's why she needs the support of secular friends and the support of friends who understand that she needs to mourn in her own way um, to reassure her that it's okay to mourn her loss however she needs to, especially you know if that means ignoring the religious-based traditions or doing things like getting a tattoo, which is another no-no for Jews. Um, I truly believe that Shiva is a beautiful concept and I plan to adhere to it throughout my lifetime, which will hopefully, I'd say God willing, but you know, um, hopefully only be twice. Um, Cause every Jew should hopefully only go sit Shiva twice. Um, but even though Shiva is about the lack of self, I think we need secular friends um, to remind us that the self is still important and also religious friends to also take acknowledgement of how sometimes our self might be more important than our religious traditions and um, you know to just remind us that the self is still important if not the most important and you need to mourn the way you need to because oftentimes mourning is a lot more about you than it is about the person you lost. And uh, that is all. <laughs>
we do have coming up a Sela Serves Lunch for Safe Place for Youth. We need about eight volunteers to pull this off. It's on Wednesday the 20th. If you can't help the day of, we do need helpers for prep work on Tuesday night and financial contributions for food costs. Big thanks to Jeff Sargent who sponsors a meal quarterly. We do like to do this every month though, so every little bit helps. And that's on the west side too. So if you're over there, we prep it all on the west side. We serve it on the west side. Also that um, when we go to serve it, it's a drop-in day and there are um, some youth that are experiencing homelessness. So they ask that all of our volunteers be 18 years of age or older. Um, then we have Cyber Name Badge, Makers Tools 101. Nerd out with lasers and servos and things that can cut you and make custom Salem name, Sela name badges. This coming in July, oh, that's coming in <laughs> July on the 21st. Be sure to check it out at our community table. There's also a full list of events. Oh, here's the cool wooden name badges with your name carved in them, right? That's really cool. Can we make mine say Oprah? That would be fun. <laughs> um, there are way too many events to mention them all. If you didn't catch all of that, you can always find everything at our website, sundayassemblyla.org. And make sure to stop by and see Todd at our community table. He's got all these papers laid out. You can sign up right there. Sign up for any of them, a few of them, all of them. Um, after this song, you're welcome to hang around and talk with us for coffee and snacks. At 1.30, we are heading to lunch at Mendocino Farms. It is about half a mile, so feel free to walk or drive and keep the conversation going. Now... We should all help Voices of Reason sing this next song. So if everyone would like to stand up, if you want to, and just hum along, sing along, clap along, do what you want. <laughs> Get up, stand up. So you <laughs> Get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Don't give it up, preach a man, don't tell me. Heaven is under the earth. I know you don't know what life is really worth. It's not all that glitters is gold. Half the story had never been told. Now you see the light. Hey, stand up for your right. Come on, get up, stand up. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Don't give it up. Most people think, yeah, great God will come from the sky. Take away everything, make everybody feel high. But if you know what life is worth, you would look for yours on earth. Cause now you see the light, we're gonna stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Whoa. Don't give up the fight, don't give it up, we 
sick and tired of your ism, schism, games. I am go to heaven in a Jesus name. No, we know when we understand. Almighty God is a living man. You can't fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Cause now you see the light. Stand up for your right. Come on, get up, stand up. Stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up. Whoa, don't give up the fight. Don't give it up. Get up for your get up for your rights. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Give them another round of applause, right? Like, they're great. Okay, next up we have, the kids have been working on a little thing back there for the fathers, so I think they want to come out and present. I want to dance. You want to dance? <laughs> Buddy said I wanted a dad. No, it's, not. it's like, Michael's over there, honey. <laughs> we got flowers and they made ties. Aww. <laughs> Come in this way, Walking. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. A special thanks to Rebecca, to um, Nicole, to the Voices of Reason, to. Julie Williams, to all of our volunteers and all of our attendees. Until next time, let's strive to live better, help often, and wonder more. Thank you, guys. <laughs>